Lakshmi. Thank you so much for all the participants for joining us. Uh, it's uh, very hopeful to see these many numbers joining us. Uh, right, Frank? It's kind of uh, uh, beginning for something new and something bigger, I guess. So I'm so glad to see the interest in people to uh, hear about this particular topic. And we're the first time we are conducting a program on natural palliative care. Thank you so much, uh, Frank, for uh, agreeing for this whole series without thinking twice when we discussed this for the first time. That's so kind of you. And thank you so much all the participants uh, who have joined for session. Uh, we have had a formal introduction of Frank. Uh, uh, Dr. Frank is from Australia and he is uh, do, uh, heading the nephropalliative care work there. And if you look at may, uh, any literature or evidence in nephropalliative care, you can see Dr. Frank's name in many of his publications. He's doing incredible work in India with a team in St. John's with Dr. Nandini Vallad and a team in Manipal, uh, Dr. Anuja, for quite some uh, for a few years now. And they also have many training programs uh, uh, running for nephropathy care. I'm not taking much time because we have a lot to cover in symptoms. Thank you so much, Frank, once again, and over to you. Oh, thank you, Sri. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, so I'll, I'll just share the screen here. Hopefully it comes up. Okay, I'll just see if this is going to go okay. Uh, Dr. Frank, are you there? Or I think he has lost his connectivity, ma'am. Yeah, I think he's... That delay. Uh, look, welcome everyone to this second uh, lecture in this series on symptom management. Um, uh, can everyone see that slide? Yes. yes. Good. So this is the second of a four-part series on kidney supportive care. The first lecture gave an overview on what is kidney supportive care, because I think before we um, um, dive into symptoms, it's good to get a, a good sense of how this whole approach, approach is unfolding, this alliance between nephrology and palliative care. So the following three lectures, including this one, will be on symptom management in chronic kidney disease. Certainly, this is a great of great interest in palliative care, and also an increasing interest within nephrology when there's a rec where there's a recognition that so many symptoms exist. And for nephrology, it's difficult because they use dialysis as a tool or, or general, uh, perhaps dietary or electrolyte balances to try and help, but um, they, they don't have the, the high skill that we have in palliative care in terms of symptom management. So in terms of the, the next lectures, the, what I'm going to start with is an overview on, on, of symptoms in CKD. Um, how do we assess symptoms? Uh, go to specific symptoms in their management. And today's lecture will be on uremic pruritus and restless leg syndrome. And of course, the question, can we make a difference? So symptoms in CKD, an overview. Whether patients with any with kidney failure, whether or not they're receiving uh, renal replacement therapy or dialysis, um, uh, they are highly symptomatic. Um, yes. Patients rate symptoms in their management very highly. What are the symptoms of patients with kidney failure? So I'm going to put up a, a chart with on one side um, a major study looking at dialysis, symptoms of dialysis patients, and then another study looking at those on a conservative or non-dialysis pathway. So I'll let you look at that now. First of all, you can see such a, an incredible array of different symptoms and also the significant prevalence of so many of these symptoms. Many of the studies done on dialysis patients show a mean number of symptoms of nine per patient. Now, that's an extraordinary number. You remember that first case that I presented last time of the woman who had dreadful uremic pruritus, restless legs, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, and insomnia. So it's not only the 
individual symptom, but how they compound with each other, even cluster with each other, and how can that can have a, a profound effect on the patient. Symptom control is challenging. The symptoms interact and compound with each other. So as an example, nocturnal, those symptoms, rest, pruritus, restless legs, pain, can certainly make people's sleep very troubled and lead to daytime somnolence and increasing fatigue. Fatigue uh, is a complex symptom, so it's not just this, comp this combination, but um, it certainly can be. And if you're able to deal with the original symptoms, the pruritus, the restless legs and pain, you may well be able to improve the person's sleep, uh, what we call a sleep dividend, and people feeling so much better the next day. Next, uh, next slide talks about symptoms deriving from comorbidities, particularly diabetes, with all the macro and micro comp vascular complications of diabetes. Kidney failure does constrain the use of medications. We're, doctors were quite nervous about using medications in this context. The pharmacology in the context of CKD is complex, with the altered pharmacokinetics of most medications in renal impairment. There are multiple gaps in knowledge. Recommendations in published data occasionally conflict on the specific doses of medications to be used. So that does make it more difficult, doesn't it? But I think within palliative care, we've got a great strength in the sense of our approach to symptoms, where we will always ask, we will think of the cause of why is this person in pain, having nausea, itchy, being very meticulous and working our way through the possible symptoms a person has, and also having this principle of non-abandonment, where we just don't um, say to a patient, there's nothing more I can do. Always asking, thinking, reading, inquiring about a symptom, what else can we do? And, and at the very least, sitting with a patient and listening to them describe that symptom, the therapy being yourself as a doctor. So what about symptom assessment? There's a couple of validated symptom in instruments in this area. The IPOS renal is used around the world um, and it's a validated symptom inventory for renal. It was important at the beginning to move away from cancer-based um, instruments because this is not cancer. And so they, they had particular symptoms. Another um, tool that's used in Canada is the ESAS renal. And the clue is why it's in Canada is the E. The Ed, it's from Edmonton. So it's the ESAS, but with some renal symptoms added on. So IPOS renal, ESAS renal. This is the IPOS renal. Um, and as you can see, it's a two pager. On the left hand side are 15 separate physical symptoms. And then on the right hand side are psychosocial and spiritual symptoms like do you feel at peace? Do you feel you, you can talk to your family about how things are going? Are you worried or are you anxious or depressed? These sort of these. So we find this extremely useful in terms of uh, picking up symptoms that patients are experiencing. And we use this instrument with every patient at every clinic. The great advantage of this is that you're not going to forget a symptom because it's all there. It's very hard to keep all these symptoms in mind, whereas we can work our way through this. And we get the patient to fill it in in the waiting room, either with a relative or with a staff member or a volunteer. So by the time it gets to a doctor, it's been filled in and you can quickly see what are the most difficult symptoms. With notable exceptions, there is little to no evidence on symptom management, specifically in the context of dialysis or CKD. So. This is a challenge, isn't it? Because we, we're always looking for evidence base. But when we ask about symptoms in CKD, there's very little. But the question is, is that true, but there's no evidence? What level of evidence exists for symptom management in CKD? In terms of the level of evidence, the symptoms fall into several categories. The symptoms with a solid and expanding body of evidence are uremic pruritus, and we'll come back to that later. Symptoms that have international evidence-based guidelines are restless leg syndrome, and we'll also come back to that later. 
Symptoms with a small body of evidence in CKD include depression and taste changes. But, but there's a lot of symptoms with little or no evidence, but a significant body of evidence from the general population. So the management is based on general principles and extrapolation. And these include pain, nausea, vomiting, dyspnea, constipation, and insomnia. So really little studies done specifically in CKD, but large bodies of, of um, studies done generally, uh, particularly in pain um, around the world. So as kidney supportive care matures, symptom management is a field wide open for research. Individual symptoms and their management. So this lecture, I'm going to talk about fatigue, uremic pruritus, restless legs. The next lecture, pain, shortness of breath and taste. Final lecture will be upper GIT symptoms or other upper GIT symptoms outside taste, outside of taste, depression and end of life care in CKD. Fatigue. This was a really interesting study done in the United States where they basically asked patients, what do they think of fatigue? What was their sense of the fatigue in this in, in for those patients? For patients undergoing dialysis who experience fatigue, fatigue is a profound and relentless exhaustion that pervades the entire body and encompasses weakness. The fatigue drains vitality in patients and constrains their ability to do usual activities and fulfill their roles and meet personal aspirations. So that I think that there's a lot in that definition, it, it, it in that definition, isn't there? Profound and relentless exhaustion, draining their ability to do usual activities. This is the major issue. Fatigue will have a, an effect on multiple other aspects of the patient, quality of life, their ADLs, need for transport assistance, getting back and forth to dialysis if they're on dialysis, and also frustration. If you're feeling very well one point, and then six to 12 months later with your kidney failure, you're completely fatigued, this is very frustrating. Fatigue in CKD has been the subject of growing international focus. There has been an international fatigue consensus workshop and the so-called SONG HD group has, has been formed. So they've been, what they wanted to do was start to find an instrument that they could use. And they developed the SONG HD fatigue. It is, it is very simple, but it is very good. It's the first validated instrument measuring fatigue developed specifically for hemodialysis patients. And they talk about a global fatigue score over the past week. It captures three domains, tiredness, lack of energy, and the inability to participate in social functions. What's its mechanism? Well, it's complex and multifactorial. One of the main elements of fatigue, but not, a, not, uh, not solely, is the story of anemia. Why is this important? Well, the kidneys produce erythropoietin, which is, goes to form um, blood cells, of course, red blood cells, uh, hemoglobin. So as the kidney fails, there's less and less erythropoietin. So as night follows day, the hemoglobin is going to fall and the person will get fatigued. The nephrologists recommend keeping the hemoglobin between, between 10 and 12. Um, and using what they call erythropoietin uh, uh, products to supplement or and give the person um, extra erythro erythropoietin. Another cause for fatigue is electrolyte imbalance. So two hypers and all the hypos, as you can see. The other thing which I really would recommend if you're meeting a patient with kidney disease with fatigue is taking a sleep history because it may be that the reason the person is so fatigued during the day is that they have a poor sleep. And why are they having a poor sleep? Well, they may have itch, restless legs, pain, etc. Another thing is nutritional deficiency. That can add to fatigue. Depression can be part of major depression. Fatigue can be part of that. And also this interesting story of where, particularly in the older, frailer patients with a lot of, a lot of osteoarthritis, um, sitting still through the day, I don't want to walk around, I'd rather sit in my chair or go to bed, and becoming more deconditioned, and that fatigue can be very pronounced. 
Another story for dialysis patients is what they call post-dialysis fatigue. This is very common, not universal, but very common, where the person after their dialysis wants to lie down and rest. Now, that's so common that it's accepted. But what about if the fatigue washes into the next day, which is your one day between your dialysis? If you're fatigued on that day and you're about to go in the next day into dialysis again, you may be semi-permanently fatigued. So that's really tough, isn't it? So the management. Well, optimise dialysis, reverse, correct reversible causes, particularly looking at the haemoglobin and erythropoietin, physiotherapy, sleep hygiene, and social supports. So, yes, I think that that's, that's what we uh, try and do. In the conservative group, um, it may be that you're not trying to always correct the, the haemoglobin. It may be that you may reach to erythropoietin if they're symptomatic. So it's not always trying to keep between 10 and 12. But if a person's symptomatic, that, 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 that may be um, the way to do this. Um, physiotherapy is interesting using upper limb exercises. So we can borrow from cancer-related fatigue using basic exercises. And I encourage patients to move around um, and have some um, exercise through the day. Okay, uremic pruritus. What is this? Well, this is the pruritus, the itch associated with kidney disease. Over the past few decades, so, uh, there's been a quiet revolution unfolding in the understanding of the basic pathophysiology of pruritus. Before we jump to uremic pruritus, let's talk about pruritus itself. In the skin, there are nociceptive sensory nerves that transmit various sensations. One of those sensations is pruritus. Look at this remarkable photo uh, published about two years ago uh, from Italy. So the red are the afferent nerve fibres heading from the dermis into the epidermis. Remarkable, isn't it? And the blue are the nuclei of skin cells. So it's a remarkable photo and a remarkably beautiful photo, isn't it? So itch is convey, uh, uh, conveyed by C and A delta fibres, but mainly C fibres, and I'll talk a little bit about them. Five to 10% to 10 of C fibres are dedicated to itch. For many years, the assumption was that this, it was histamine that was setting off those itches. But look at this, this remarkable paradigm shifting research found that of the itch fibres, only 10% were histamine dependent and 90% are histamine independent. So there's this whole wide world of non-histaminergic itch out there. So I guess there's a couple of myths here, isn't it? That all itch is histamine mediated and the best first line medication for pruritus of whatever cause are antihistamines. Let's talk about the, the pathogenesis of uremic pruritus. Look, it does remain obscure. We don't have a complete knowledge. But we do know this, this very interesting study show that uremic pruritus follows a non-histaminergic pathway. This is fascinating, isn't it? And yet, all around the world, kidney uh, centres are still using antihistamines for uremic pruritus. So we're, we're, we're blessed having a Cochrane review of the management of uremic pruritus published in late 2020. What did they say? Of all the treatments for uremic pruritus, gabapentinoids were the most studied and showed the greatest reduction in its scores. Gabapentinoids, gabapentin and pregabalin. Kappa opioid agonists also may reduce itch, but indirect comparisons suggest a much more modest effect in comparison to gabapentinoids. So gap, gap, kappa opioid agonists, are, uh, uh, if you uh, stimulate those receptors, that has an anti-itch effect. And those kappa opioid receptors are in the skin, hence the use of these medicines for uremic pruritus. The Cochrane Review also found evidence more moderate for several other agents. Turmeric, that's interesting, isn't it? Zinc sulfate, oral montelukast, topical capsaicin. Uh, now, why might these work? Well, turmeric inhibits TNF-alpha and interleukin-6, which are almost certainly part of the inflammatory milieu of uremic pruritus. Leukotriene B4 is a 
uh, a powerful pruritogen, which is almost certainly part of uremic pruritus. So that's perhaps the action of the oral montelukast. And topical capsaicin denudes substance P from the nerve afferents. We don't use that on its own topical capsaicin because it's out of the chili family. And often people find this an intolerable burning sensation on their skin. But it's just interesting, uh, those four that they've, they've looked at. So what's the approach in our clinic? Well, first of all, we ask every patient at every clinic whether they have experienced itch in the past week. But we also pause here because often people assume that because they've got end-stage kidney disease and they're itchy, they must have uremic pruritus. And in fact, no, not every patient who is itchy has uremic pruritus. And many times, or not many times, but several times we've been caught that in fact they had scabies or psoriasis or eczema. So we're just careful just to watch and look at the, um, examine the person, have a look whether they've got a rash, et cetera, that in fact may be not uremic pruritus. In other words, not everyone with kidney disease with itch has uremic pruritus. Okay, so we've talked about the Cochrane Review in terms of the evidence-based. So what we do is I suppose we have three categories of treatments, topical preparations, oral medications, and ultraviolet. Topical preparations, first of all, using moisturizers. Um, xerosis or dry skin is very common. While it doesn't cause uremic pruritus, it makes it worse. So we encourage people to use sorbeline or QV cream. We also advise them to use plain non-perfume soap or goat's milk soap is seen as one of the best, or body cleansers. Also keeping the skin cool. If, it's, if there's a lot of heat around, uh, particularly hot showers or other heat, hot environment, that can make the itch worse. So keeping the skin cool. So coming back to the capsaicin, so on its own, no, because it causes this burning feeling. So what we've been doing is compounding the capsaicin with another agent, menthol. Now, menthol as, acts on our cold receptors, and that has an anti-itch effect. So it's interesting if you get the balance of capsaicin and menthol correct, you can balance out the heat of the capsaicin, the cold of the menthol, and both of them are having an anti-itch effect. Also adding in some lignocaine as well into that combination, that working on the sodium channels. So in very, it's not, not common that we use this, but sometimes we might use this combination for very, very difficult itch. Systemic therapies, well, the Cochrane Review spoke very well of the gabapentinoids, but we have to be very careful with the dosing. So on dialysis, we use gabapentin 100 milligrams um, or pregabalin 25 milligrams after each dialysis. So this might be three times per week compared to someone with normal renal function where you might be moving to three times per day of gabapentin. If the EGFR is less than 15, we might start at 100 milligrams every second night and titrating to effect. One of the authorities is starting to move on this topic, is starting to move to each night, but we're perhaps a bit more conservative in using it every second night. But you may use it each night, depending on the side effects. So these are baby doses, aren't they? And if the EGFR, that should be greater than 15, gabapentin, uh, 100 milligrams noctay or pregabalin, 25 milligrams. Pregabalin, some good studies showing um, efficacy. So we use them pretty well interchangeably now, gabapentin and pregabalin uh, for uremic pruritus. Evening primrosol, not a great deal of evidence for it, but it's such a simple agent. And what it does is reset the um, balance in the epidermis of the essential fatty acids to reduce the pro-itchy cytokines. So that's how it works. Evening primrose oil, um, uh, the, the active ingredient is gabalinolinic acid or GLA. So, okay, so how, how have we been in terms of the success or otherwise of managing uremic pruritus over these years um, at St. George. So between those years, about 680 patients have done at least one IPOS. Our prevalence rate was consistent with international data. Extracting those who reported severe to overwhelming itch at their first clinic visit, what did they report at their third clinic visit? And was that initial response sustained over time? So in terms of, yes, the answer was by the third visit, there was a significant reduction from the severe to overwhelming itch into the slight to moderate range. So you can fairly quickly get control here. And does that sustain, does that sustain over time? Well, as you can see for 
kidney or dialysis, renal replacement therapy patients moving from severe to overwhelming and holding them in that range um, over a long, long period and the conservative group as well. Restless leg syndrome. So what is this? This is somewhat a bit of a, is a mystery to a lot of doctors, but it's a reality to a lot of patients, unfortunately. What it is, is the following. A, a feeling in the legs, often very hard to describe, a feeling in the legs, followed by an irresistible urge to move the legs, made worse by sitting down or lying down, made better by standing up and walking around, and usually worse at night. Now, this is going to have a profound effect on sleep, isn't it, if you've got restless legs? So this is the international definition. Now, not all kidney failure patients with a disturbance of their legs have true restless leg syndrome. Remember, we talked about the itch. Not everyone with itch has uremic pruritus. Um, so people can start to talk about, and particularly if they use restless, often doctors jump and said, oh, you've got restless leg syndrome. But in fact, you might have leg cramps, peripheral neuropathy, osteoarthritis, pruritus, akathisia. So lots of different things. So what I now realize the best thing for me to do when I'm asking about this is sit back and be silent and ask the person to describe what they're actually experiencing. And time after time, the patient with restless legs will almost give a textbook definition of, of what they're experiencing. And I accept that they've got that. What are the well big association with sleep disturbance and daytime somnolence? And imagine if you're getting a restless legs while you're on a dialysis chair, you are wanting to get off that chair and the nurses are saying no. So it may be that, that you're going to have multiple premature ceasings of dialysis sessions, which is not going to be good overall. The mechanism is not completely understood, but this, this is where the science sits now. So this is the basal ganglia. Um, this is the production of dopamine, okay? So iron is an extremely important part of the production of dopamine and iron sits in the dopamine 2 receptor on the other side. So the theory is that there's a, a problem with iron um, transport into these cells. So this is not general body iron metabolism. You may have pristine iron studies, but you've got a problem with transport of iron into these cells. And this is going to disrupt this whole process. Why is this so? Why is restless legs so circadian? Why is it so worse at night? Well, our entire iron metabolism is circadian, and also this area of the brain is intimately connected to the hypothalamus, which has our circadian clock. So management. Well, I think you can see from that graph that that diagram. The best the one way of dealing with restless legs is giving some dopamine at night. So, and that works, and there's some good evidence for using a dopamine agonist at night. But we have to be careful as to which group we use pamprexol, ropinirol, rotigogine. This particular group, there's another group that we do not use because of quite significant cardiac side effects. So it's this group, pamprexol, ropinirol, rotigogine. Gabapentin. Now, this is interesting. Could gabapentin help here? And the answer is yes. So there's been several studies showing the efficacy of gabapentin for restless leg syndrome. Three RCTs comparing pregabalin, pamprexol and placebo to good effect. Opioids. Now, this is a curiosity, isn't it? Why would opioids possibly help restless leg syndrome? Well, the theory is this. They have a protective effect on dopamine cells that have been subject to iron deficit. So some of the leading um, researchers in this area did an amazing study a couple of years ago showing the benefit of oxycodone in restless legs. I've never used it for restless legs, but it's fascinating, isn't it? Methadone, potentially used for restless legs. Iron infusions, yes, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? If you flood their body with iron, you're going to supplement the amount of iron in the brain and that will have a temporary benefit, but it is only temporary and we're not repeatedly giving iron infusions. This is interesting. So this Giannaki and the group in Italy have put pedals at the base of a dialysis chair. So the person 
uses those pedals when they've got the restless legs to good effect. So it's giving a signal back to the brain that my legs are moving, my legs are moving. What do the international guidelines say? Well, they have the gabapentinoids as the first line treatment. These drugs are effect, have effect and have little risk of augmentation. I'll just explain the augmentation. Augmentation is a side effect of the dopamine agonist where you, where you start to get over time the, re the restless, the the, uh, the the onset of the restless legs moving from late evening or night through to late afternoon even. So that's a big change there, and it's a side effect, and you have to be careful. Gabapentinoids don't have that effect. But it's very fascinating that gabapentinoids are considered first-line treatment now uh, for restless legs. If the dopamine drugs, dopaminergic drugs are elected as initial treatment, the daily dose should be as low as possible. So we do have patients. Um, we usually start gabapentinoids, and if it's not working or they're resistant, potentially adding a dopamine agonist as well. And the uh, guidelines talked about other medicines to consider opioids, including oxycodone and methadone. So isn't that fascinating that we've got gabapentinoids uh, from the Cochrane Review on uremic pruritus being seen as the leading medicine, the, the International Restless Leg Study Group putting gabapentinoids as the leading medicine for restless legs. And also internationally, if you look up the guidelines for diabetic peripheral neuropathy, the gabapentinoids are the, are the first line treatment there as well. So this remarkable story of gabapentinoids having this effect across three separate symptoms. Now let's go back to Our Lady. You remember from the first lecture, this particular poor Aboriginal woman with absolutely shocking symptoms. She was a diabetic nephropath. She'd been on hem hemodialysis five years. Remember the lady where she talked about severe restless legs. She talked about itch all the time. It becomes ferocious. She talked about her severe, how awful pins and needles were causing that severe diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And sleep, I asked her, you remember, she said, I don't sleep, I doze in five minute lots. I sit on a chair and put my elbows on my knees to hold them still and I pray to die. What a, what a terrible suffering person that I encountered. So what did I do for her? What medicine could I possibly use here? Well, I put her on gabapentin. She said, doctor, this doesn't make any sense. I've got all these symptoms and you're using one medicine. And I said, yes, one medicine for three symptoms. So remember, she was referred there. So what happened to her? I broke my normal rule by starting her on 200 milligrams at the end of each dialysis. Why did I do that? Well, partly because she was so much younger than most of my other patients, and also because her symptoms were so egregious, so awful, that I thought we just need to control this as quickly as possible. I did warn her about side effects of gabapentin, but she didn't get any of those side effects. About nine days later, I rang that particular dialysis unit and asked her, asked them, how is she? They said her symptoms have disappeared and a marked improvement in sleep. And her sleep was the best I have had for a long time. So isn't that fascinating that this one medicine covering those three symptoms? To what extent can the symptoms of dialysis change patients be managed successfully? So this study was done locally where we looked back over our data and over a seven year period, the IPOS renal, and 80 dialysis patients had at least three clinic visits. The symptoms that, that were uh, reported um, uh, uh, in, in that gravity, that severity, were insomnia, pain, lack of energy, poor mobility and itch. We found that there was a significant improvement in combined physical and emotional symptom scores. And the greatest improvement in were those five most severe symptoms. The follow-up to final clinic median 13 months shows sustained reduction in mean combined physical and emotional scores. These changes occur without changes in dialysis severity. Perhaps, so this perhaps gives an indication that good symptom management can certainly improve these symptoms. It's not like we have no idea what to do about this. And what's the effect of what's the evidence for um, effectiveness in the conservative group? Well, this is another study that was done in our group looking at uh, elderly patients on a conservative pathway, a non dialysis pathway. And we followed survival, quality of life, and symptom control over six to, six to 12 months. And we found that 
um, uh, stable or improved about two thirds of them uh, by six months and about three quarters by 12 months, which would either stable or improve symptomatology for those groups. So I'll pause there. I'll, I'll stop now and um, open up for questions, but thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Frank. Uh, to all the participants, uh, it will be helpful if you can type your questions in the chat because there are so many participants, so it might be impractical for uh, people to unmute and ask. But I'll take up the questions from the chat. There is already one question in chat, uh, uh, Frank, about if they don't have methadone, but uh, methadone, sorry, uh, but the ASD and ALD level is double than normal, can we use government? Um, so, so just the question was, if you don't have methadone, if you don't have methadone, yes. Yeah, uh, but still the ASD and ALT level is double than normal. In that case, can we use GABA printing? Okay, so, yeah. so, so what? Just, just maybe describe the the level, the AMC and ANC. That's to do with. Uh, AST and ALT level. Oh, excuse me. I understand now. The liver function. I ex excuse me. Sorry. Okay. Um, look, I think in that context, if those liver fun. Ex oh, sorry, I was so slow to pick that up. In in those contexts, uh, yes, gabapentin would be okay to use. Um, mind you, we're using the gabapentin in very small doses, as you can see um, from the slides. So I think yes, if there's any concern about um, well, I suppose the QT story for methadone and potentially other issues of uh, where the liver where liver failure may be coming through, um, then yes, I, I'd be happy in the small dose of gabapentin to be using that. Thank you for that question. So another question is regarding, uh, can you see the chat, Fran? Oh, yes, it's coming up. So in terms of evening primrose oil, look, it depends what local um, manufacturers make of evening primrose oil. So we tend to use one to two capsules BD, um, and that might be all that's required. Um, it's without side effects. Um, it's not a, a large dosing. Um, yes. I mean, you could, but I mean, there would be evidence, sorry, there is evidence for using it topically, but topically is quite a hard thing to be putting all over the body, isn't it? Um, and as I said, we, we don't, I mean, we talk about the use of those compounding creams in most difficult situations. Um, uh, the next question was, I think, the maximum dose, did you say there? Yes, maximum dose of Gabapentin. The maximum dose. Okay. I think what I tend to do is I don't have a particular maximum dose in mind, but I know I need to start very low and be careful as I rise the, raise the dose about side effects. So I'm always warning the patients about those classic gabapentin side effects of drowsiness, um, some myoclonus, blurred vision, ataxia, these things. And so what yeah, so so it may be that once you get to 100, maybe 200, you may have hit the maximum then. Um, it's pretty unusual for kidney failure patients with an EGFR of under 15 or a dialysis patient to be having doses more than, say, 200 milligrams. Interestingly, what we also do, is in the dialysis patients who have said the gabapentin is helping my itch or restless legs, except during dialysis. Why is that? It's because the gabapentin or pregabalin is being dialyzed out. So what we do is we give a dose before the dialysis and a dose after. The other, other technique we use is um, getting the gabapentin capsule um, if it's too much, it's say 100, it's okay, but 200, they're falling asleep. Getting the gabapentin capsule and opening it up, mixing it with water and drawing up an aliquot of, say, 25 milligrams of gabapentin. So smaller doses. So that's a technique that we've used. So we've got a, a pac some patients on what looks like very unusual dosings of gabapentin, like 75 or 125. Uh, sometimes we do that. So the next question. Uh, I think it's about, uh, can you just uh, one more time show the definition of restless leg syndrome? Oh, yes. Um, would you like to go back to that slide or? Uh, that's what she has asked. 
Yep. Um, so I'm very happy to do. Oh, unfortunately, yeah, I've. We can, yeah. uh, can, we can I've, share the presentation, right? Uh, Frank, we'll be sharing your presentation to them. Yes, I'll just see if this is going to work. Um, Oh, I might be struggling here. Um, but just going back over that definition. So um, the definition is a dysesthesia or sensation in the legs, followed by a um, an irresistible urge to move the legs. The patient doesn't have control over it. Made worse by sitting down or lying down. Made better by standing up and walking around. And that there's no other cause. But, but I'm happy to perhaps send these slides through um, so that you can have a look at those, yes. There is another question about the role of psychotherapy for restless leg syndrome, despite the pharmacological measures. Is there any role for psychotherapy? Well, um, I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I, I'm, I'd be aware, I'm aware that that, that is proposed and can play a role, but I think it's such a powerful physical symptom um, that it, 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 pro it probably does require medications. People do talk about sleep hygiene, no coffee at night and getting to sleep, and that's going to help you. Look, it may or may not improve the restless legs. It may or may not improve the sleep. But having seen so many patients with uremic restless legs, I think the the um, the benefit of the medication sits there, yes. Uh, so uh, about um, anticonvulsants, whether it is pregabalin or gabapentin, it's your choice. Um, so the, the question was, what about other anticonvulsants? Is that correct? Uh, no, whether it is pregabalin or gabapentin. What about pregabalin? Like, uh, oh, you, what about pregabalin? Yeah, which, which is preferable, whether it is pregabalin. Oh, I see. I see. Look, I think over time that we see them, I see them as equal. I don't have a particular preference for gabapentin or, gab or pregabalin. I do know that the smallest dose of pregabalin at 25 milligrams represents more than 100 milligrams of gabapentin. There's a slight change there, of course, there, uh, just a slight increase. So, um, so I guess if you're concerned, particularly in the older, frailer patient, starting them on gabapentin would be fine. Uh, but I don't have a particular preference for gabapentin versus pregabalin, no. Yeah, I think uh, it applies mostly in neuropathic pain management where the therapeutic range of pregabalin is much wider. And yes. many times in India, we don't have those high dose preparations available. So that's where we choose to give pregabalin than gabapentin because uh, it's easier, because the range is much uh, smaller than the pregabalin where you can go up to 2,600 milligrams. In I see. Maybe that's something that they might have related with. So that's really interesting. So if people have got more familiarity with one over the other, then go with the one that you're most familiar with, of course. Uh, so uh, there is a, there are a lot of questions. Uh, I'll be bombarding you with a lot of questions now. How to improve uh, the hemoglobin level apart from erythropoietin injection in patients with CKD? Okay, so with that, I think the other thing is to check a couple of things. They need, you need to check the iron levels and vitamin B12 levels because it may be that that's the reason the hemoglobin is low, that there's insufficient iron or B12 as well as the erythropoietin. So supplementing that or checking those figures, and that's the role of a nephrologist to do, um, checking that. Um, yes, yeah, so we rely very much on the nephrologist to keep a close eye on that. So um, is what is the dose of pramipraxol in restless leg syndrome is one never pressed? Okay, so with that, um, I start at the lowest dose. Now, I'm not sure what's available in India there, um, but the lowest dose in Australia is 0 0.125 milligrams. So it's a very, it's a baby dose. 
um, and then to perhaps move on to 0.25 and build up that dose. So it might be that the initial dose is gives perfect control or you may need to increase but do it fairly promptly you don't need to wait long periods i'd even do it after the even the first second dose if it's not working then start to lift up the pamprexol dose with the ropinirole um, that would be um, 0 0.25 0 0.5 milligrams and lifting up that dose yes um, yeah so you just choose one of them and lift up if you're if the restless legs are becoming if they're becoming resistant then you may swap one of you may rotate from one dopamine agonist to the other and we do, as i said in the talk we sometimes use both gabapentin and the dopamine agonist uh, together because they're working they're working in different ways so there are a few questions which is I, i'm combining those questions and asking what is the role of, I mean, what is the preferred antidepressant and uh, role of uh, antidepressant in fatigue or insomnia? Whether it is antidepressant or benzodiazepines for insomnia. Oh, now insomnia we're going to turn to in one of the other talks. Um, so yeah. we'll come back to that. Um, look, I think it, just in general terms, what I tend to do with insomnia is really clearly understand why it is that the person is not sleeping. And time and time again, we start to reveal that they have itch, restless legs, pain, rumination about things, anxiety. So I'll try and go to the source of the symptoms of why they've got insomnia. Of course, in the modern era where people are using devices a lot to make sure that they're not having screens near their eyes through the, the evening uh, because that can keep them awake, using coffee, all those classic things of sleep hygiene. But yes, yes, um, benzodiazepines uh, can have a role. Um, and also what's becoming much more used now, and I'm not sure whether it's been used in India, is melatonin. Melatonin. Um, and it's been found that dialysis patients have a significantly reduced natural melatonin rate in their, in their brains at night. So that's been fascinating to see that and supplementing melatonin and using that as the main, um, uh, not sleeping tablet, if you like, but the main uh, response to that. Yeah. So uh, any take on uh, a gabapentin um, and risk of fall? Uh, sorry, I just missed that. Any take on gabapentin and? Uh, patients, uh, patient, whether the patient is at risk of fall Oh, yes. A very good question. So if they've got a risk of falls, uh, you'd, need, you'd need to be careful, of course. You'd need to be careful with your dosing. So what I tend to do is start to think, is there another medicine that I may use in place of the gabapentinoids? Or if I'm going to use um, gabapentinoids, I'm going to use it in a very small dosing for that patient, like every second night or even every third night, potentially, um, for those on a conservative pathway, or, or asking them, as I said, to break it up and, and make it up into, say, 50 milligram uh, gabapentin uh, dose. So, um, but you're quite right. We just need to be careful with people who are already falling with the use of the gabapentinoids. That's very true. So if they've got uremic pruritus, using the moisturizers, the bland soap, keeping the skin cool, cutting back their fingernails, those sort of things, and maybe some menthol on their skin. Again, you are back to gabapentin. A patient who is not on dialysis, but the creatinine level is uh, around 2.5 and has a dry, itchy skin, uh, is gabapentin indicated? Yes, look, it would be indicated on a non-dialysis, a conservatively managed patient. Um, what I would do if it's got a dry, itchy skin, I would certainly start with sorbolene, QV cream, moisturising the skin regularly after bath or shower. Um, all those things I've just mentioned, keeping the skin cool, etc. And then, and then getting them back and say, is this better or not? If it's not better, potentially using the gabapentinoids in those small doses, say gabapentin 100 milligrams every second night or pregabalin 25 milligrams every second night. 
So I think a very similar question. Now you have answered that gabapentin is indicated in lower doses. So I think again, same question have, uh, has come up again. Um, uh, I think we should not underestimate the use of uh, topical uh, you know, the moisturizers, keeping the skin moist and uh, um, uh, not too dry. Uh, many a times it just work like wonders. Uh, patient gets a lot of relief. Uh, that without any therapy, they just get a lot of relief with just topical applications. I totally agree, Shri. I think I th what Dr. Shri said is completely correct. And in, and I think to start with the most basic things rather than going straight onto a medicine is a very good technique. And it may be that moisturising the skin regularly um, does have a, a very good effect. Yeah, here I, th I think in India we have this uh, liquid paraffin which is available, which is very, very cheap. And it stays moist for a prolonged period of time. So we tell them to apply it immediately after their shower so that a little bit of moisture locking action is there and apply as frequent as possible. It is very cheap and it is very easily available. So affordability is not an issue with the uh, liquid paraffin. Sometimes it, it just works uh, uh, very well. Um, uh, there are a few questions on nausea and insomnia, etc., which I, uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about it in the next session. Uh, so I'm just... Uh, Insomnia will be coming, uh, although Frank mentioned briefly just now, we'll be dealing with that in the next session. Uh, what do you think about the role of physiotherapy in patients with CKD? The role of physiotherapy in patients generally? Uh, yes, yes. In patients oh. with CKD is a gen general problem. Oh, oh, I think, oh, yes, no, no. This is a, a very important um, topic, isn't it? Um, I think uh, I, I see many, many patients who are starting to become very deconditioned uh, with tiredness, um, being on a dialysis chair four, five, six hours, three times per week and wanting to go to bed straight after. Um, on a conservative pathway, really becoming, um, uh, as I said, weak and tired and, and that deconditioning can creep up really profoundly. So yes, exercise and, physio and physiotherapy, if it's available, I think has a profound benefit uh, for people in terms of, well, all aspects of their health. Um, but it, so, and it may it may not have to be so complicated. You may not have to have an exercise physiologist telling you this, uh, but I think some basic physiotherapy would be uh, very, um, very helpful um, and, and encouraging people to, to exercise and move around. Yes, because it can just creep up and, over months and years, people become more and more deconditioned. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, any so when you mentioned about turmeric, uh, you I I'm guessing you mentioned about the local application because in India we take turmeric orally also. So. Yes, and this is fascinating, isn't it? Um, that 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 Cochrane review had turmeric as one of the four with the moderate level of evidence. Those trials, looking at those trials of now, I've never used turmeric, but I, but I'm very intrigued by it. And I'm um, and the studies, and my understanding, of those studies are oral turmeric, but but there'd be no reason why you couldn't use it topically because you'd be having an anti-inflammatory effect on the skin. I'm just wondering whether the audience or you, Shri, personally have noticed, um, well, just in terms of around India generally, whether uremic pruritus is such a big story or maybe not as much because people have turmeric in their diet. Any take on that? Because I think in Indian cooking, we use a lot of turmeric and we do otherwise, even even otherwise, we do take turmeric with milk and other preparation. So maybe it's it's an interesting thing to know whether it reduces the symptoms. It, it is interesting, natural. isn't it? Because if you, and, and I don't know whether there have been studies done um, on, or well, presumably there have been studies, prevalent data of uremic symptoms in India, um, but it may be that those figures are lower than in other countries because of the use of turmeric. Potentially, it's interesting, isn't it? Maybe any, any I, I'm guessing a few uh, uh, nephrologists are there in this group. So probably uh, I'll wait to hear from them whether they see a lot of pruritus. 
डॉक्टर सुगंधा आई थिंक योर क्वेश्चन वॉज अगेन ऑन क्रियाचन लेवल पॉइंट नाइन मिलीग्राम पर डेसीटर and uh, uh, can we use gaba pentin i think frank already answered that in the above question where the creatinine level was 2.5 i think um, that's why i didn't i didn't read out that question uh, did I, if, if i missed some other question that you have asked uh, just just let me know um what is the preferred antihistamine for pruritus well um i don't use antihistamines and partly because um of that that study that showed that uremic pruritus is almost certainly a non histaminergic itch a non histaminergic itch so we tend not to use it i know it's used all around the world um but i guess the obviously you'd be using a non sedating antihistamine if you were to use it but i think that there's been a big um a, a big turning away from antihistamines more towards the moisturizers the gabapentinoids and now coming out of the united states a big enthusiasm about the kappa opioid agonists now the those medicines are really that particular class of medicines doesn't seem to be available outside of us and japan um but it's something that will come on time yes So uh, I think Dr. Sugandha's question was specifically on cancer patients. Uh, so I was just answering. I mean, even otherwise, in cancer patients, we do use uh, gabapentinoids for neuropathic pain. So uh, because of uh, cancer, I guess there is no contraindication for gabapentin to be used. Yes. Yes. Uh, absolutely. There is a question, uh, Dr. Atul. uh your question on nsids in end of life we have one specific session on end of life care so probably we'll be seeing how to optimize medications what is indicated and what is not indicated when someone is dying uh, maybe one last question a uh, role of acute puncture in restless restless leg syndrome uh, in the in event it can occur yeah look th- there has been some evidence for that um and indeed acupuncture for uremic pruritus as well so so um there is there is some evidence for that um it's not high or robust but look i think it would be worthwhile if if you're struggling with a patient who has intractable restless legs to consider that um so but yes uh, would i mean I, i guess it's just a question of the access to to an acupuncturist who's got that skill um to try that um uh so it's not it's not without evidence but it's certainly the the international restless leg study group very much looked towards the gabapentinoids the dopamine agonists thank you so much i think we've taken almost all the questions i have i've combined a few questions together which is mostly on gabapentin but different aspects of uh, using gabapentin that's why Uh, i combined everything there are a lot of comments and appreciation for you frank uh, it, it was an enlightening session and it was an excellent presentation and uh, i hope we'll be able to share uh, your uh, notes or presentation or whatever is available um yeah so there is a lot of uh, appreciation for you for today's session uh, thank you thank you sri we have taken all the questions uh, thank you so much frank uh, there were a lot of questions as usual like last time but you were very patient to answer each and every question yes and you were able to relate it to the evidence with whatever is available yeah. thank you so much and this is the first time we are going little deeper diving deeper into nephropathy to get very very interesting and a lot of uh, new new points that we are listening uh, so we'll be coming out with another interesting continuation of the symptoms new learnings next week again with frank please uh, try to join us uh, we'll be discussing a lot of many more symptoms and topics that we have not discussed before uh, so there is a question uh, maybe or request uh, to include uremic encephalopathy as a symptom for yes. discussion uh, for patients not going for hemodialysis so yes that's that's one suggestion Yes. Yes, Dr. Sheetal will be will be doing that. Thank you so much, Frank. See you next week for and, another enlightening session. Good. That's lovely, Shree. Look, thank you so much. It's been lovely to have everyone's company again. Um, and take care. Enjoy this next week. Enjoy your weekends, of course. And I'll, I'll see you, of course, uh, next week.
Thank you, Dr. Frank. Thank you all for joining today. We'll see you next week. That's Frank. lovely. And thank you so much for the organizing and the how 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 organ how thorough you are with the organizing. It's very impressive. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.